I don't think this the Celtics is really that great. I don't think they just do a lot of things to make them great. Uh, you know, they uh, when the game get down to the line, you know, see like all their players play together and come together. Don't don't make too many mistakes. They know what they got to do. But uh, Boston can be beat. So sorry to leave you now, baby. As the Boston Celtics lifted the 12th NBA title in the summer of 1974, the Rockets were still struggling to establish themselves in the league and in the city of Houston. The NBA's new luck began when the San Diego Rockets moved to Houston and 5'9 Calvin Murphy launched himself and the league into the current season. Baby, but I just gotta say goodbye. It had been two years since the departure of the Big E and the young core the team had built through the draft were joined by Jack Marin, who had been the main return in the Hayes trade as well as former number one overall pick Jimmy Walker who had so far failed to live up to high expectations in his first five years in Detroit, but was far from a bust, and would produce consistently as part of the Rockets' starting backcourt. The hasty sale of the team and resulting move made the travel schedule extraordinarily difficult during their first year in Houston. My play leaves early in the morning Poor lightning just gotta be Houston bound They operated on a schedule that had been designed for a team in San Diego. They started their first season without a home arena, touring not just different venues in the city but also across the state. This was a big contributing factor in the poor attendance the Rockets saw for home games. Mike Newlin remembers the team would play wherever anyone had a free gym that night because the team had no arena. We played Hoffman's Pavilion, we played downtown, I forget what it's called, the Coliseum downtown. Played in Houston one night, played in LA the next night, Washington DC, back to San Francisco, back to New York, and then back to Houston. That was the kind of schedule we had that first year. One of the more intelligent and personable performers to grace the National Basketball Association, Newlin also is one of the most unpredictable. Newland feels the positive way to get ahead on the basketball court is to react without thinking. He is a headstrong, aggressive player who will deliberately go knocking into benches or flying into the stands if he feels it will shake up his teammates. A superstar Mike Newland will never be. He'll settle for his current role as an integral part of a young Houston team. Without question, he also is the resident thinker on the Rockets squad. Whoa, Lord, if that old Rudy Tomjanovic recalls learning the team would be relocating when he switched on the news at home, and his initial thoughts were that it was a bad idea as Texas was football country. After struggling during his rookie season in the team's last year in San Diego, averaging just 13 minutes a game, Rudy would become a key part of the rotation in his second year. Rudy really started to show why Houston had selected him second overall in the 1970 draft as he finished the 72-73 season with averages of almost 20 points and 12 rebounds per game. Now here's what I want to tell you and I want you to understand. See, I live in Houston. On full 15 in Maine. Houston was ready to move on to their next head coach halfway through the 72-73 season after a 10-game losing streak to start the calendar year. Tex Winter was replaced by Johnny Egan, who had played for the team before retiring the season prior. He guided them to a 33-49 finish. The Rockets began their third season in the city of Houston with a heartbreaking overtime loss in Buffalo, the first of seven games they would play that year that went beyond the fourth quarter. They would lose six of them. The team would gradually trade away players throughout the season. Jimmy Walker would be traded to the Kansas City Omaha Kings just three games in. This would free up more minutes for Calvin Murphy in the backcourt after he threatened to leave for the Harlem Globetrotters over the summer. Yes, Mr. Lord, don't you know that you ain't right? Murph was now the team's primary weapon in the backcourt and would average over 20 points per game. 
Rudy Tomjanovic made the 1974 All-Star Game, the first of five consecutive selections and would average a career-best 24 points per game for the year. Jack Marin was traded away in February and the Rockets ended the season with 32 wins. This is Houston, say again please. Houston, uh, Houston we've had a problem. We've had a BB bus underbolt. Roger, main B underbolt. In St. Petersburg, Virginia, basketball sensation Moses Malone was getting ready to make history. I'm going home and get my morning meal. The American Basketball Association's most recent attempt at gaining a competitive advantage over the NBA was to start allowing their teams to draft players straight out of high school. In the course of uh, one of our after-meeting sessions of uh, staying up all night and uh, drinking beer and trying to figure out what it was we were going to do, we came up with the quote, the hardship draft. And for players that had a hardship, uh, we would be able to be the benevolent sons of the American way and give them a way out. One of the theories was we wanted to draft players early, way ahead of the NBA, uh, so that we'd have an opportunity to try to get the players signed. There were lots of drafts, all, in quotation marks, secret drafts. They're having a secret basketball draft in there. Yes, Mr. Lord, don't you know that you ain't right? Moses would briefly attend Maryland with no real intention of playing there, dropping out during his first week after he was drafted in the third round of the 1974 ABA draft by the Utah Stars. When we signed him, I knew that he had great talent. I had no idea that he would be doing the things that he's doing right now. Uh, he is one of the quickest jumpers I've ever seen. He could be maybe the best offensive rebounder in the history of the game. Uh, he's very good at it now, and I'm sure in a year or two, when he's old enough to shave, he'll be excellent. She said I'd get drunk every day. The addition of Moses Malone was a big get for the upstart ABA that was still desperately trying to force a merger with the NBA as financial struggles were causing its teams to fold, threatening the very existence of the league. The Utah Stars would cease operations at the start of Moses' second year and his rights were sold to the spirits of St. Louis. Darling, but I just gotta say goodbye. Egan and the Rockets management kept the roster together over the summer and a more consistent locker room led to an improved 41-41 record in the 74-75 season. Well, you know I don't want to see you worry. The Houston Rockets had made the playoffs for the first time since their move to Space City and the second time in franchise history. They would face the New York Knicks in a best-of-three matchup. I remember my first trip, New York. I was 13, or 14, about 6 to 6 and skinny. There was this playground tournament up about 165th Street and Amsterdam Avenue. There were these three fancy city dudes, and they were using their flashy behind the back and between leg stuff to beat everybody. My cousin looked at them and said hey, I know a guy who can beat you all. They said, who? And he pointed at me. So, I found two guys who could and even play. One was from New York and the other was from my hometown in Petersburg. We played to 32, and my team won, 32 to 20. I got 30. Twenty-five seconds and counting, we are still go. Twenty seconds, guidance alert, the guidance system now going internal. Fifteen, fourteen, thirteen, twelve. 11, 10, 9, 8, ignition sequence start, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, launch commit, liftoff, we have liftoff.
1975, the Houston Rockets launched themselves into the playoffs and would have home court advantage over the New York Knicks. Calvin Murphy's game-high 22 points helped them take a 1-0 series lead in Houston. Unlike today, the New York Knicks were a serious basketball team that were loaded with talent and had already won two NBA championships in the 70s. However, there were signs that the squad were on the decline, scraping their way into the playoffs with a 40-42 and record, and the young Rockets looked ready to pounce. The veteran Knicks were able to hold their own at MSG as Walt Frazier's efficient scoring night led them to a 106-96 victory. Both teams would return to Houston for a decisive Game 3. Rudy Tomjanovic would better Frazier's efficiency, going shot for shot with New York star guard. Paced his team on 12 of 15 shooting as the Rockets controlled the game throughout, blowing out the Knicks 118 to 86, claiming the first playoff series victory in franchise history. Awaiting Houston in the next round with a defending champion Boston Celtics coached by Tommy Heinsohn, boasting a talented and experienced roster that still featured former U of H star Don Chaney. Over the off-season, construction finished on a new arena that the team would call home for the next 30 years. The recent success in the playoffs saw ticket sales spike and ownership were hopeful that fans would start flocking to the summit to cheer on the Houston Rockets. Irvin Kaplan had bought the team from the original owners in 1973 and found himself in legal trouble that led to him selling the team. He was charged with state security fraud given an eight-year suspended prison sentence and over $3 million fine. He blamed his crimes on financial difficulties that arose due to the financial drain caused by his ownership of the Rockets and hockey team the Houston Aeros. He would sell the franchise shortly afterwards. The team ran it back for the 75-76 season and early in the year Calvin Murphy would set a record for consecutive free throws made.
I made 78 free throws in a row, uh, which was a, a world record. I didn't realize how important it was until so I saw my picture in the Guinness Book of World Records. And then I missed one, and the one that I missed is the one I remember. When the ball left my hand, I said, oh my goodness. I knew that ball was not going in. The Rockets continued to win as many games as they would lose. As a Christmas Day visit to play the New Orleans Jazz at the Louisiana Superdome approached, they were 14 and 14. Some last-second heroics from Pete Maravich would push Houston one game below 500, but they would quickly rebound by defeating the reigning NBA champion Golden State Warriors who were once again led by Rick Barry who had returned from the ABA. Much to everybody's surprise, Barry's Warriors had swept Elvin Hayes and the Bullets in the 1975 NBA Finals. Perhaps the most heartbreaking loss of the season came against the Washington Bullets as former franchise star, the Big E, Elvin Hayes, hit a game-winner at the buzzer. A five-game losing streak at the end of the regular season would cost Houston a spot in the 1976 postseason as they finished with a 40-42 record. General Manager Ray Patterson replaced head coach Johnny Egan with Tom Nisalka, who he had known during his time with the Milwaukee Bucks as Nisalka was an assistant underneath Larry Costello. He had coached many star players including Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as well as George Iceman Gervin when he coached the San Antonio Spurs of the ABA. Most recently he coached the young Moses Malone with the Utah Stars and after the franchise folded, he committed to coaching the Puerto Rico national team at the 1976 Summer Olympics. Despite losing the majority of their games, the team fought hard when playing the USA and lost by just one point after turning the ball over on a charge call on the game's final play. The Rockets would trade up in that summer's draft and selected John Lucas with the first overall pick. Lucas had been a first-team All-American two years running at Maryland and had also represented his country in the 74 FIBA World Championships where the USA finished with the bronze. It wasn't immediately clear no Lucas would fit alongside Calvin Murphy, so Nisalka brought him off the bench to begin the season. The construction of the roster for that season wasn't yet complete, however, as Ray Patterson was about to make the biggest trade in the team's short history to acquire the next face of the franchise. To begin the 76-77 season the NBA would expand to include 22 teams. When the Rockets first joined the league with Seattle in 1967, they were the league's 11th and 12th franchises. 1968 saw the Milwaukee Bucks join the East and the Phoenix Suns join the West. When Buffalo, Cleveland and Portland joined in 1970 the league realigned into the four-division system. The Rockets moved across to the Eastern Conference's Central Division following their move to Houston. The New Orleans Jazz became the 18th NBA team in 1974, also joining the Central Division. 106 to 104, 26 for Williamson, 22 in the second half. Well, now they say 28 for Williamson, so let's make it 24 in the second half. Skinner has the ball. Five seconds to the championship. It turns. It's all over. It's all over with three seconds to go. And the crowd storms out of the court. One second. The clock is out. And the ball game's over. Pandemonium. As the New York Nets win. one call 106 
tied up. Now this is the music that we tied up with. The four teams joining the league this year were being absorbed from the ABA which, on the brink of collapse and down to just six teams, had managed to convince the NBA to take on the New York Nets, Denver Nuggets, Indiana Pacers and San Antonio Spurs. We didn't pay much attention to it. We thought it was a bunch of guys trying to become pests. They weren't playing in big cities, number one. Number two, they didn't have enough credible ball players. Sort of a minor league with a couple of players. And it's always a question of how long would they continue to lose money before they fall into the tent. The Denver Nuggets and Indiana Pacers would join the Eastern Conference. The New York Nets and fellow Texas team, the San Antonio Spurs, would join Houston in the Eastern Conference. The Kentucky Colonels and Spirits of St. Louis would cease operations and their players were made available to NBA teams through the ABA dispersal draft. I felt let them rot. <coughs> it was only a matter of time before they were going to quit, but uh, the owners didn't want to wait. Fans were excited to see how the ABA players would fare against the competition in the NBA and the highest expectations were on Julius Irving. The lure of Dr. J brought over 15,000 people into the summit as the 76ers visited Houston for a game early in the season. There was another young star from the ABA in the building that night. Sitting on the Rockets bench for all but eight minutes was Moses Malone who had been acquired by a trade from the Buffalo Braves after playing just two games for them. Houston was, in fact, Malone's fifth team. After both ABA teams he was unfolded he was taken by Portland in the dispersal draft who traded him to Buffalo before he played for them. He had wanted a more central role that Buffalo were not willing to assure him of so Ray Patterson brought him to Houston, reuniting him with former coach Tom Nisalka. Moses Malone joined John Lucas on the bench at the start of the season. The two knew each other as they had briefly been college roommates during Malone's short stay at Maryland. By December they would join Calvin Murphy and Rudy Tomjanovic in the starting lineup as Mike Newlin, Kevin Cunnett, Dwight Jones and John Johnson would rotate in as the fifth starter. The team exceeded expectations almost immediately. They would play three consecutive overtime games, winning them all while displaying a competitive edge that continued to grow as the season went on.
the Rockets won 17 of their final 25 games of the season to earn their first division title and Tom Nisalka was named Coach of the Year. In the playoffs a familiar face awaited Houston in former franchise star, Elvin Hayes, and the Washington Bullets. Mitch Kupchak's 32 points on 14 of 18 shooting were enough to help Washington take home court advantage away from Houston in Game 1 at the Summit. Losing Game 2 was not an option and a determined Moses Malone powered his team to an overtime victory with a phenomenal 31-point, 26-rebound effort. 15 of his boards came on the offensive end. The series headed back to the nation's capital where Kupchak hit 8 of 10 shots for a game-high 23 points in a 93-90 win. He finally cooled down in Game 4, going 4 for 12, as Rudy and Calvin combined for 57 to tie the series at two games apiece. The Rockets would then win Game 5 back in Houston behind 40 points from Calvin Murphy and a 22-point, 25-rebound game from Moses Malone. With the opportunity to close the series out in six games Rudy Tomjanovic took full advantage, netting a game-high 26 points in the win. Houston flew into Philadelphia for the next round to face Dr. J in the 76ers but would return to the summit without a win. Moses took control in Game 3, netting 30 points and grabbing 25 rebounds but was held to just 5 points on 1 of 8 shooting in Game 4 as Philly took a commanding 3-1 lead. Houston managed to rally from a 17-point deficit at the end of the third quarter of Game 5 to force the series back to Space City for Game 6 where the 76ers would close out the series. Philadelphia native, Jake O'Donnell would call a charging foul as John Lucas drove to the basket with five seconds left in the game, wiping out what would have been a tying bucket, leading to a 112-109 6s win. Despite the disappointing end, this was the franchise's most successful season to date and it left fans hopeful that the Rockets would be able to defend their central division crown and achieve even greater postseason success. I've never coached a better player, I've never coached a better competitor, and I've never coached a better person than Bill Walton. At the beginning of the 77-78 season Houston would lose 9 of the 10 games they played between November 8th and 28th. This streak of poor form was bookended by two overtime victories, the first over Rick Barry's Golden State Warriors and the second was a 120-116 win over the team that had knocked them out of the playoffs earlier that summer, the Philadelphia 76ers. On December 9th, with a record of 9 wins and 13 losses, they would fly into LA to face the Lakers. Kermit Washington and Kevin Cunnett got into a fight after battling for a rebound. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar would pull Cunnett away and restrain him. Washington caught sight of Rudy Tomjanovic running towards him from behind, he turned and swung a punch that would forever alter the careers of both men. Tomjanovic would not immediately realize the severity of the injury. 
he would confront Washington as they were escorted past each other in the corridor and security pulled them apart. I didn't see it, but I heard it. It sounded like a, a melon that had been dropped on the floor. He was rushed to the ER at Sentinella Hospital where he learned that a bitter taste he experienced after being struck was spinal fluid leaking from a crack in his brain cavity. Before being taken to ICU he made two phone calls, one to his wife, Sophie and another to his friend and teammate Calvin Murphy. The next major hurdle was to make it through the second night. I was willing to make any compromise just to be alive the following morning. By the grace of God, I again made it through those dark hours. The next morning Dr. Toffel had good news. The brain cavity had sealed and the leaking had stopped. I was out of danger. The NBA levied a hefty $10,000 fine and 60-day suspension against Kermit Washington and adopted a no-tolerance policy to future offenders. Rudy spent the next few days in hospital battling for his life as his team finished their road trip with blowout losses on consecutive nights in Phoenix and Seattle as basketball was the furthest thing from the team's mind. The rest of the season was a struggle for the Houston Rockets. Along with Tomjanovic's absence, Mike Newland only played in 45 games and Moses Malone got injured in February. The Rockets' worst losing streak of the season climbed to 13 following a March 22 loss to the LA Lakers. They would end the season with just 28 wins, finishing at the bottom of the Central Division. You know what I'm talking about. Just let me know if you gonna go to that home. The vets, uh, they did a lot of pushing. You know, they pushed me around, but I pushed them back. Uh, I really don't. I really don't worry about what they do. But I figure what they can do, I can do. So this year, it's a lot different. This is gonna be my rookie year. Uh, uh, with four years of experience behind me, I, I think I'm ready to play this year. They give me a lot, lot more respect because uh, uh, they know one thing: I'm, I'm not going to let them get in and push me around. If he wouldn't have played against oh maybe one or two players that were as good as he was, and so by coming into the pros, I think it was a great advantage not only monetarily, but he's played against better competition, played more games. He's been an all-star in the ABA and an all-star in the NBA. That's pretty good for a young man, 23 years old. The Rockets made a big splash in free agency by adding veteran, Rick Barry. The NBA would send John Lucas to the Warriors as compensation. The move put the two best free throw shooters in the league on the same team. Both Rick Barry and Calvin Murphy took uncommon pride in their ability to hit foul shots, honing and perfecting their technique over the years. We were on the same team. I would joke with him all the time that I got to shoot all the technicals if I was in the game when he was in there because I had a higher free throw percentage. He didn't like that. <laughs> After Murphy set the record for consecutive free throws made in 1975, Barry broke it the following year. We always are just asking questions like, who would you want on the free throw line to win the game? in the history of basketball. It always comes up as Rick Barry. He had finished percentage points ahead of Murphy for multiple years and promised his teammate that the trend would continue. I shot over 94% my last two years. I set a record at 94.7% for a single season. I got in Calvin's head when we were teammates and would say, Calvin, you do realize that you'll never win the free throw title as long as I'm playing. Another new addition to the roster was Mike Dunleavy who the team had signed before the end of the previous season. An expanded role for Robert Reed in his second year and the healthy Tomjanovic and Malone had coach Tom Niselka hopeful the team would get back on track. The year started well with away wins in New York and Boston before a huge 52-point blowout of the New York Nets in the home opener at the summit. 
The team were four games over 500 heading into 1979 and in February Moses Malone, Calvin Murphy and Rudy Tomjanovic were all named to that year's All-Star team. Rick Barry averaged a career-best and team-leading 6.3 assists per game, becoming the primary playmaker after replacing John Lucas. Moses would emerge as a true superstar by the end of the season, averaging 24.8 points and 17.6 rebounds and became the first Houston Rocket to be named the league's most valuable player. I went there on the ball, you know, I studied my players, and you know, I watched the flight of their shots. And uh, when I go to the rack, you know, I try to get that uh, defense position for the office man to do something to get the rebound. Uh, players like Rudy T, Calvin Murphy, you know, uh, uh, Rudy T, he got some like a straight shot. Murphy got some like a uh, low ash on his shot. So I try to get position, uh, the possibility of trying to get the rebound. And once I step in the position, it's just hard for the officer, officer man, the defense man to move. Despite averages of 24.5 points, over 20 rebounds and 4 blocks from Moses, Houston were quickly swept in two games in a first-round miniseries against the Atlanta Hawks. Assistant coach Del Harris would take the reins for the 79-80 season. Harris had coached at high school and college level before working in Puerto Rico. He gained his first pro coaching job under Tom Nisalka with the Utah Stars and moved to Houston with him when the ABA folded. Now there's the Houston starters. The little man in the backcourt, Calvin Murphy. Robert Reed will move in to take Gervin into the backcourt. There he is, Moses, number 24. And look at the two forwards, you recognize them, Rudy Tomjanovich and Rick Berry. The Rockets traded away Mike Newland, who had spent his first eight years in Houston, to the New Jersey Nets but added Paul Mokeski and Alan Leval through the 1979 draft. Leval made an immediate impact in his rookie season, averaging 27 minutes and appearing in 77 games. The new season saw the league introduce the three-point line and Rick Barry would take full advantage of the rule change having had experience of it previously in the ABA. In what would be his final season he led the league in three-point attempts per game, finishing with 73 makes for the year. He would also make good on his promise to Calvin Murphy, leading the league in free throw percentage, shooting 94%. Murphy finished second with 90%. The team would see another change in ownership as George Malouf paid $9 million for the Rockets. He died the next year, leaving his family in control of the franchise as his son, Gavin, became the new owner. Houston finished 41-41 in their first year under Del Harris which set him up for a first-round playoff matchup against in-state rival the San Antonio Spurs. Of the four insurgent ABA teams the Spurs had shown the most promise so far. They were led by the Iceman George Gervin who was the top scorer in the league, averaging over 33 points per game. the Convention Center Arena in San Antonio, Texas. It's the San Antonio Spurs and the Houston Rockets. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Brent Musburger, and of all the matchups this year, this is the one that I've been waiting for, Houston and San Antonio. Let me bring in my partner, old six-pack, I'm sorry, six-gun Hundley. All right, Brent, I'm coming down here for the shootout at the Alamo. I've got my cowboy hat and my jalapeno peppers, and I'm ready for this game. The championship <laughs> of the state of Texas. And we got some great names here today. Stop. Calvin Murphy. <laughs> hey, how about that one? Rudy Tomjanovich, Moses Malone, George Gervin. Shot is missed by Bristow. Barry's got it down as the rebound comes out far. Oh, to Malone. What a pass by Rick. Whoa! 
After splitting the first two games the Rockets exploded for 45 points in the third quarter of the deciding Game 3 and would go on to win 141-120, to setting up a second-round series against the Boston Celtics who were led by Rookie of the Year, Larry Bird. Houston was soundly swept in four games. None of them were close. A third Texas team joined the NBA for the 80-81 season when the Dallas Mavericks were added as an expansion team. Houston and San Antonio would move across to join them in the Midwest Division of the Western Conference. We're winding up a four-game road trip, and you can watch Moses Malone lead the Rockets versus the Utah Jazz Monday night at 8.30 right here on Channel 39. When Ray Patterson offered me the job to do the television, I was really excited about it. And that first year in 1980 and 81, I worked with former Rockets coach John Egan. Bill Worrell would also begin calling games for the Houston Rockets and would remain the consistent voice of the team for four decades. A breathtaking new mascot named Turbo would also join the franchise, performing daredevil stunts during breaks in the game action. <laughs> Harris coached the team to just 40 wins that year. Robert Reed emerged as the team's clear second option behind Malone. Averaging 36 minutes per game, 10 more than Calvin Murphy who was next on the minutes played list. Murphy and Rudy Tomjanovic were both now 32 years old. Tomjanovic would fall out of the rotation almost entirely after suffering an injury and playing in only 52 regular season games. Alan Leval, Mike Dunleavy and Tom Henderson filled out the guard rotation. In the front court, Moses was joined by Major Jones, Bill Willoughby and, the whopper, Billy Pulse. The Rockets had acquired Paltz from San Antonio in January 1980. He had played in the ABA and forged a successful career with his crafty mid-range game and signature, sweeping hook shot. Uh, the turnaround for the Rockets uh, uh, was basically a defense and a, uh, a mental toughness which eliminated our turnovers and uh, cut other teams' shooting percentages down. A combination of those things got us on a, on a winning track. The sub-500 record that season was still good enough to earn the team a first-round playoff matchup with the Los Angeles Lakers that pitted two of the best big men in the game against each other. Struck the game and we're underway. Game number one of this mini series. That lady with two fouls, but coming back and picking up the two points. Kareem, I think Jamar wanted that one. Cutting it down. Here we see the last play where Kareem got that rebound. Now, watch this move. He goes right around Malone, who came over. Now, look at how he just finesses it and finger rolls it up into the basket. Moses was, in, in my opinion, in the top five of all time centers. Players that had to go one on one with him was afraid of him. The, the, one of the greatest centers I had the good fortune of playing against was Jabbar. And Jabbar could do absolutely nothing with Mo. Mo was too strong for him. Pat Riley are also, the Rockets are playing good basketball. Kareem pushed Moses back, misses a shot, and again, Los Angeles getting the shots they want, but they're not dropping for him now. This Houston team won four of their last five games, and they had to do every one of those, win every one to get into the play again. Moses Mo and so anytime they matched up, one of the reasons why we were able to beat the Lakers when they were, you know, the Lakers of the Showtime era was because Mo controlled the inside.
scored in this fourth quarter. He has 14. What? Moses is there again. Look at the strength of this guy. The shot was blocked. He still got it away and a chance for a three-point play. And that has to be very discouraging to Kareem because he blocked. He went out to block the shot. He left his man to block the shot, and no one picked up his man. You, when you get, get beat there, now he blocks the shot. There goes Moses Malone. Right in, nobody picked him up. 33 points for Moses Malone, and yet he was up there against the seven-foot-two center of the Lakers. And to Kareem, he has position against Malone. That was inevitable. The way he got the ball down. Magic Johnson, you can't hear yourself think right now. There's a foul on Moses Malone. There's Dow. He's here. Kareem stays with him. Rebound, Reed. And now, Magic Johnson with it. Here come the Lakers trying to run it. Broken up by Calvin Murphy. Murphy will head to the other end. Magic doubling back on defense. Malone, look at this hustle by Malone. The new face of the league, Magic Johnson, had won a championship in his rookie season and was looking to do the same in 1981. An exciting first two games saw each home team lose in close fashion. This play was designed for me to get the ball, drag it over to Moses' side, and they overplayed Moses. I thought I had a drive, I went into the middle. Uh, Kareem came to help out, so I dished the ball off to Calvin, and then I moved to the open spot and got the ball back, and I was open for about a 17-foot jumper that I put in. Uh, it's probably the biggest shot in my career, and uh, it enabled us to get by L.A. and into the next round of the playoffs. In the final moments of Game 3 in L.A., Mike Dunleavy hit the decisive shot that ended the season for the defending champions and sent Houston to the next round where a Texas showdown against the division champion San Antonio Spurs awaited them. Led by Moses Malone, the Rockets went back and forth with the Spurs. The attention that opposing defenses had to pay to Moses Malone, due to his offensive prowess and unrelenting hustle on the glass, gave the rest of the team lots of room to work within Del Harris's slow-paced defense. Calvin Murphy and Robert Reed emerged as the team's main options behind Malone and both players shot well over 50% in the series against the Spurs. Rudy Tomjanovic had suffered a groin injury earlier in the year and despite being available was now struggling to make the rotation. Neither team would win consecutive games for the entire series. After taking home court advantage in Game 1, Houston closed the series out 105-100 in the decisive Game 7. The team were on a roll. After being in the NBA for 10 years, finishing up my 11th, finally being recognized as not just a team to make up the NBA schedule, but a legitimate, good organization with sound basketball players is very important to us. Their first trip to the conference finals was on the horizon, and their opponents would be the Kansas City Kings, who had just defeated the Phoenix Suns. Five of six games they played on the road in the playoffs so far. Here comes Dunleavy. Reed Lambert, nice pass. Most players might have taken that time with that much time left on the clock, but he saw that inside shot, and he knew how much time it was. He took it 
made a very intelligent pass. Look at that. That's a pass to Malone. He just kicked it off of the backboard. Out of level now in there for the injured Calvin Murphy. Murphy hitting that elbow on the floor. Moses Malone, and he's fouled by what they hope to have him back and have him closer to peak form by Friday night. Hurts on second team all the NBA. Nice pass. That will count. Goaltending. The Kings had also finished with a sub-500 record, making this the first conference finals between two teams with losing records in the regular season. Kansas City has come out here with a 23-12 lead. They're backed up, trailing three games to one, Willoughby to Malone. That's where After a blowout win in Game 1, Moses Malone would struggle as the team split Games 2 and 3. Up it comes to Lambert. Good job. Lambert had 16 points in their only win thus far in the series. He would respond with a huge 42 point effort in game four as the Rockets took a commanding 3 to 1 series lead. Lacey gets it out to Burks on level. Moses Malone, and we're all even. 50 to 50. 80 to 79. 5. 49 left in the game. Malone backing in on Lacey and a foul. That basket will count and a chance for a three point play. Lacey committing a personal foul. Here we see the big play again, and who's the man? Moses Malone. Calvin Murphy, it's been a long time coming for this guy, 11 years in the league before he could make it to the championship final. Picked a good year to do it, too. Match up! Match up! I don't think your mic is open, Rick, right now. There's a three-point play with 13 seconds. Calvin Garrett, Houston, has won this Western Conference Finals. They moved to the championship finals for the first time in the organization's history. It's academic now as the Houston Rockets have won the Western Conference Finals. The Rockets now await the outcome of Philadelphia, Boston. I'll tell you something, this Houston team will be an interesting club for either one of those clubs to face, Bill. Yes, because this is a different Houston team than they've played before, I think. Moses 36 and 11 was enough to dispatch the Kings in Game 5, sending the Rockets to the NBA Finals to face the Boston Celtics who were coming off of a tough seven-game series against Dr. J and the Philadelphia 76ers. With us. Welcome to historic Boston, home of baked beans, the Boston trolley, and a creaky old building just dripping with basketball history known as the Boston Garden. their first season back in the West, Houston was crowned conference champions and all that stood between them and the Larry O'Brien Trophy were the team that swept them out of last year's playoffs and beat them in both their regular season games this year. In fact, Boston held 15 consecutive victories over Houston. Fueled by adversity and determined to prove the doubters wrong, the Rockets jumped out to an early lead in Game 1.
six points. And we'll see Moses. See how Bird got up in the air as Bill pointed out. He couldn't get the ball to Archibald, who was behind Henderson. Instead, it goes right to Malone. He goes up for the shot. You, you see how he knew it wasn't going to go in. He chased it back down, puts it back on the floor, Go chases after, after it again when he knew he missed it. Finally makes a fake, gets ML out of the way, and lays it in the basket. maintained control of the game throughout until Larry Bird rallied his team in the fourth quarter, leading them to a 98-95 victory. Ever since I've been in college or in pros, uh, the ball has always came to me. They always want me to do the final shooting or try to hit the last second shot. They go to me 80 or 90% of the time. I want the ball because I'm supposed to produce them situations. Uh, sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but uh, I want the ball in a crucial situation. They go to the board real well. You know, they get out and run. We've got to stop their running game. Uh, we've got to play tough defense and uh, we've got to be tough man when we've got to play against the Boston Celtics. 29th consecutive time we have a sellout here at the Boston Garden game two of the NBA championship finals the Houston Rockets against the Boston Celtics Moses Malone would do his best to pull Houston level in game two scoring 31 points and pulling down 15 rebounds Reed Pulse Moses Malone Mike Dunleavy along with Tom Henderson in the backcourt and for the Boston Celtics, Maxwell, Bird, Parrish, Archibald, and Ford. And the Boston Garden is filled again, as we said at the top of the show, for the 29th consecutive time. And Phil Russell, it is a noisy crowd. You're setting the pick here. We got Al and Paul. Al and Paul set this pick here. Malone, you go. If he's wide open, give it to him. If not, curl to the ball side, Malone. To the ball side if you don't get the lob. Break out, get the ball, and try to turn right down to Malone. We want to get the shot in the next five seconds if we can. Dunleavy inbounds to Reed. Reed to Allen Level. Level drives the baseline with a trio of Celtics contesting his shot. Let's make him hit it jump. Everybody listen now. You gotta play just good, solid position defense. We're ahead three. Don't, Don't go trapping or taking any silly chances to steal. We want to play position so that they do score. It's a tough shot over a hand, right? All right, we're in the bonus, so we don't want to foul the shooter. Whatever you do, don't foul the shooter. And wait a minute, Larry Bird, back to Tiny. And the Houston Rockets have evened it up. The Houston Rockets have broken a 14-game losing streak to the Boston Celtics. They even up this best of seven series with a 92-90 win. And I am really impressed with the way Houston stayed in this one. This futuristic landscape contrasts as sharply with Boston's antique charm as do the Rockets and Celtics' styles of play. Game three is a landmark event in Houston sports history. The Rockets will become the first established pro franchise in Houston to ever host a world championship.
Game 3 was a physical battle that saw the more experienced Celtics hold the Rockets to just 24 to 79 from the floor for a season low 71 points. The first NBA Finals game from the summit ended in a disappointing 23-point loss, but the team had an opportunity to rebound immediately as Game 4 would take place the very next night. The fact that in the, the final games and in the, uh, of the season in the playoffs, we've been able to play Moses for 46 or 48 minutes, Robert Reed for 45, 48 minutes. Uh, you haven't had to work in uh, substitutions uh, like you have to over a, an 82-game schedule. Del Harris trimmed down to a six-man rotation and would once again even up the series. Mike Dunleavy scored a game-high 28, Moses Malone added 24 along with 22 rebounds and Robert Reed showed a tireless effort on both ends of the floor. Robert Reed has been spectacular on defense. He has held Larry Bird to eight points in each of the last two games. While the shooting has dropped off, he came back in game four with 19 points to go with 13 rebounds. And the Rockets have even it up. When visiting players hear the closing words of the National Anthem and the roar of 15,320 Boston fans, they are reminded of the old Celtics, whose success in the Garden was considered their birthright. It's a lonely place for a visiting fan, but the Rockets felt that a team effort could overcome any obstacle. Tonight is Game 5 from the Boston Garden. <laughs> Welcome to the NBA World Championship Series. Tonight, game number five, the Houston Rockets visit the Boston Celtics. This CBS Sports Special is sponsored by Light Beer. Everything you always wanted in a beer and less. Alongside me is Bill Russell. And before I bring in Bill Russell, I want to show you a quote by Moses Malone. Moses Malone said, they ain't that good. I could get four guys off the street of Petersburg and beat this basketball team. And Bill Russell, I would think that Bill Pitts might have that up in the locker room somewhere to fire his Boston team up. If he needs to do something like that, he's in real trouble. But I don't think that's quite so. 
that you get four guys out of Petersburg. Now, if he's at San Francisco, maybe. And besides that, Moses in the finals after uh, it was 2-2, two to two, nobody will ever really remember whether this was said in jest or exactly how it came about. But in order to fire up his team, he had a quote uh, oh, I could take four guys off the streets of Petersburg, Virginia, which was his hometown. I could take four guys off the streets of Petersburg, Virginia, and beat the Celtics. And Bill Fitch was a Celtics coach at the time. He was known for scanning the newspapers at length to try to find bulletin board material. And so it didn't take long for that quote to get into the yellow highlighter category. That was up on the Celtics bulletin board when they got back to Boston for game five. And, and Boston was pretty fired up. The Celtics would take control in Game 5 back in Boston as Cedric Maxwell, the eventual Finals MVP, led him to a 29-point blowout win. She packed my bags last night, free flight Zero hour, 9 a.m. And I'm gonna be high as a I know, I don't believe it. Rockets, NBA, all right. Just love them, always have. Hey, man, it's surprise team of the year. Well, we didn't, we didn't think they'd make it this far, truthfully, but now that they have, we're really behind them. I think they're great, and I'm uh, just glad to be here to witness this because I know they're going to win today. You're looking at the NBA World Championship Trophy, which may be presented tonight if we do not have seven games. I miss the earth so much I miss my wife It's lonely out in space On such a timeless flight And I think it's gonna be Larry Bird had struggled on the offensive end throughout the series, but was doing everything he could to help his team to victory. I, whenever somebody releases a shot, I want you putting a rare end on him. He's got two offensive rebounds already. Don't want him to have any more. He would grab 92 rebounds in the finals, just too short of Moses Malone's total number. Despite rallying a comeback in the fourth quarter, the Rockets' first appearance in the NBA Finals would come to a close in Game 6 of the Summit. The team fell 102-91, the first time they had lost consecutive games during the playoffs that year. $35,000 plus if they vote what you would expect the regular shares because they got $50,000 for the best record, $50,000 for the division title, $42,500 for the semifinals, and by winning the finals, $230,000. You know how, how much things have changed. First year we won the playoffs. I got $1,900. $1,900? In fact, their playoff share now was more than my salary was the first year I played. And there's the trophy that will go <laughs> to the Boston Celtics. And I want to tell you, I cannot say enough for this Houston Rockets team. They truly have been a Cinderella club. They have not quit. They haven't. 
we have with us the Commissioner Lawrence O'Brien. Thanks, Harry. First of all, I'm sure nobody will mind. Let's say a good word for the Houston Rockets. They did a terrific yeah. job, and they do right. And the people of Houston should be proud of them. Gavin Maloof wants to shake hands with Harry Mangorin and congratulate him. The owner of the Rockets, the owner of the Celtics. And now for the 14th time in the history of the The world champion. Go Red Red Auerbach, Bill Fitch, and all the players. Red Auerbach has his victory cigar out. Red, did you ever get tired of this? Never, never, never. And I'll tell you one thing. We got off the 13, we're on the 14. They were simply tremendous. They really showed a lot of character all the way through. I think Fitch, Harry, the ball players, they all came through. I'm so proud of them, like any other championship. Yeah. Yo! Yeah. And all the science I don't understand It's just my job Moses Malone's postseason performance was one of the most dominant ever, leading all players in points with 562 and rebounds with 305. During the offseason, a Houston basketball legend returned to the franchise as a conquering hero. Mr. Elvin Hayes of the Houston Rockets. You know, when you make it big, they say you're on Easy Street. But when you really make it big, you're on Hayes Street. You can get on Hayes Street behind the wheel of your own yellow cab. You can drive when and where you want, full or part-time, and make about 450 a week or more. Hey, if you want to get on Hayes Street, just come by Yellow Cab's main office. It's located at 1406 Hayes Street. Ray Patterson traded two second-round draft picks to Washington for the Big E, Elvin Hayes. This was the writing on the wall for the man who had become the team's leader after Hayes' departure. not be room for Rudy Tomjanovic in the Rockets' new front court, he turned down an opportunity to play for Utah and retired from the game of basketball. In his first game back in a Rockets jersey, the Big E would emerge victorious over his old rival, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and the Lakers in the season opener that went to double overtime. The Big E lobs it to Malone underneath against Memphis. A look at a very special hockey player. Wayne the Great Gretzky. What a phenom. What a move by Malone. Malone with Kareem inside. Hayes gets the bucket. And so that's what he does. He very rarely takes a bad shot because he knows what he can do and what he can't do. When they played the Lakers later in the season on February 20th, Moses Malone avoided overtime, scoring the winning bucket in the dying seconds of the game. Is the clock. That's it. That's all there is left. The Rockets either win it right now or we go into overtime. First option is Moses. He's open. He's yes. fouled and he makes it. Earlier that month, while playing against the San Diego Clippers, Malone scored a career high 53 points. Two one on one with Charlie Chris down to Malone. Moses strong to the basket. Dipsy doodle shot. Oh, and he's fouled. All the way down to Malone. Great pass. Moses turns, lays it up. Two on a move by Mo. He quickly brings it up. Henderson going down the middle. They'll give him inside to Malone. Come on, Moses 50. Make it 50. Good. 51. Malone's going to go down, and Elvin pops out, and they kick it right back to Moses. Got his own rebound. Moses. Keski leaning all over. Moses, leaning on him and holding him, trying to stop him, and still couldn't stop him. Moses, Seven days later, he would set a new NBA record for offensive boards in a single game, breaking his own record with 21. And there will not again be a full house here in Houston. Even though the Rockets are winning, they just don't seem to turn out and fill the house. 
In this game against the Supersonics he finished with 32 total rebounds and 38 points. Reed. The best in the business. He continued to rebound the ball with unrivaled proficiency all season. Shot from outside the last couple of years. Here's three on one. Moses behind the back to Reed. Moses tips it in. Despite a slow start, the team finished 46 to 36, earning a playoff berth behind another MVP season from Moses Malone. They would face Seattle in a best of three miniseries. The Sonics' fast break got the best of them in game one, but Houston would put on a dominant performance in game two, holding their opponents to just 70 points. In Game 3 back in Seattle, the Rockets had no answer for the Sonics' tough defense and fast, organized offense, losing 104-83, failing to advance past the first round. season over, the franchise had a big decision to make as Moses Malone's contract was expiring and he had already rejected their first offer. In August, he signed an offer sheet worth $13.2 million with the Philadelphia 76ers. The Houston Rockets were hesitant to match and let the franchise and league's most valuable player leave town to team up with Dr. J. The move made the Sixers immediate favorites for next year's NBA championship. They would win a league-best 65 regular season games. Only the Milwaukee Bucks would manage to get a game against them in the conference finals as they dominated the postseason like no team had ever done before. Cheeks on his way to the world championship, the Moses slammed up. Congratulate the world champion, Philadelphia 76ers. How'd it feel to get it in four straight though? Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> We just came out and played the ball we we're capable of. Hey, Alfredo. Mo, how do you feel? Oh, I feel great, man. I had to go to the boys for a quarter. Hey, I feel great. I feel great. Hey, uh, hey, hello, hello, Al. Hey, Alfredo. And uh, Mr. Gill, Mr. Gill, my mother, Mary Malone, and my little boy. This is Mo. We're the champs. Talking, talking. And I think it's going to be a long, long time. And I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's gonna be a long, long time Moses remained in the league for 12 more years, playing for 5 more teams 7,694, then we get to the game, 76-90 for 10,034, he's got it. Moses Malone has just established a new NBA record for free throws made in a career. By 1995, he was the only player who had played in the ABA left in the league and would retire after 21 seasons of professional basketball. Moses Malone and his long shot almost tipped in by Doc Rivers. Wow, what a finish to the first half. Moses almost hit an 80 footer. I think it's gonna be a long, long time. And 
Well, I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's gonna be a long, long time And I think it's 